Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Newton Ag Solutions. Well, the winter storm that's going across parts of the Midwest uh, today, uh, I'll have to be honest, I think I underestimated the, the size and strength of this. Uh, the wind field around this is just incredible, and it's causing a lot of problems here, especially right through parts of Illinois and Indiana this evening. The front of the south has had severe weather along it. We're going to watch this continue to extend toward the north and east here over the next 12 hours or so. Looking at some of the radar data, now this is color coded for precipitation types, so these colors represent the heavy rains and this would be the snow on the backside. It was the quick conversion over to snow uh, here in parts of Missouri, Illinois, northern Indiana, southern Michigan, plus the very um, heavy banding we saw on the backside of this has been very problematic. Um, just to kind of give you a quick story, when I drove home from Indiana today, it took me an hour to go from Champaign, uh, Illinois, to Muhammad, Illinois, and that's only a six mile drive. I witnessed five car accidents along the way. They were all in slow motion and everyone was okay, but uh, there was also a huge pileup on Interstate 39 this evening. So I'm kind of looking at this system through a very sobering lens uh, tonight, just watching the impact of this massive winter storm. To the south, we've had a lot of severe weather as well, and I was just keeping an eye on some of the current lightning strikes down here as they go through Mississippi into Alabama, but also have some storms here, um, you know, just to, to the east of Nashville in parts of uh, Tennessee and some lightning strikes here over in, in, in Ohio as well. Storm Prediction Center today did pick up on, um, got 34 reports, including three tornado reports, all of them uh, in Alabama. So this, this was a very potent system. And while we had, you know, assessed it as being very strong with respect to its wind field, it really outperformed, I think, what uh, the models were suggesting and uh, certainly what I was forecasting. And I think about all of that and ask myself, where's the pattern kind of going over the next 10 days? Because our 12Z runs today, this is from the European model, uh, continue to put more systems coming out of this kind of Arklatex region here and running along this same path. We have, of course, the one we're still watching today. That's included in some of this forecast. But then there's actually two more coming next week. Now, there's one very good thing that we're starting to see in this pattern, and that is this next system that's coming through over the weekend could be bringing in precipitation to a region that desperately needs it. I'm talking about this part of the North Central Plains, and it's going to deliver some snow into this area. That's a place that's been in deficit. I think we need to talk about this because um, if the month finishes the way that the models are currently projecting, uh, California could have uh, very easily its driest start to any year that we have on record here. I'll show you that real quick here. So far through the 17th, early in the morning on the 17th, every climate reporting district that has the number 130 in here in the West is having its uh, dry start uh, to the new year. And we continue to ask ourselves, what would it take to return better flow to California? And, you know, I've pushed hard to think that the MJO was going to be the dominant player pushing the ridge to the west, uh, and that's continued to fail to do so. And I'm going to talk about that in a few moments. But I have better news for this stretch in through here, an area that's been very dry as of late with the next system that's going to come through. And we need to pay close attention to how the drought situation changes in the Midwest moving forward. So this has been the primary issue. Uh, just looking back here since the beginning of this year, we're looking at the anomalous or the departure from normal jet stream flow. Because of the ridges that have sat over the western part of the United States, the, the, the flow compared to average has been very strong like this. That's what's allowed much colder air at times to come into the eastern half of the country. But when, the, when you look at the fact that the net flow comes offshore in California, runs from here to, to, to basically, look at this, it goes to Hawaii. That's exactly the opposite of what we call the Pineapple Express, which happens when it flows this direction and just absolutely targets California with incredible amounts of precipitation. We will not see that setting up this year, uh, not with this line. Either. We will not see a situation where we have multiple, you know, very strong uh, um, you know, flow events coming out, you know, not from that direction, but the other way coming from this direction moving forward. It's just not really a highly likely thing when you have a La Nina. But there is a shift going on right now. We're getting better moisture to the plains. And this is going to be very important because when you look at the percent of normal snowfall through this morning on the 17th, there's a large area in through here that's missed out on a lot of the snow. And the next system coming through is going to help with that. We're helping this area in a big way uh, right now with this current system. And this is going to move into New England. And why this is so important to, to revive uh, the snow in this area is because if we look down there at the soil moisture levels, you know, they're very low down to a depth of 40 centimeters or, or uh, 16 inches right in through this area. 
Now, uh, I'll tell you something, there's a lot of flooding going on right now in the eastern Corn Belt. We still have frozen ground from like five to 18 inches down, but all that rain that just fell here, um, combined with the snow melt from the previous system has made, I mean, I drove past several fields today that just had large, you know, standing pools of water in them. So it's really um, a very strong divide here between the haves and have-nots with this moisture. And so we're gonna see the pattern hopefully flipping around a little bit to help things out. Now, I think one of the big reasons why um, I've struggled so much with um, the forecast of the position of this ridge, because there's been a lot of indicators that it should move, should it should form more here of the Aleutian Islands. I think the biggest problem that I've had now that I've had some time to look at it is I've not properly forecast this downstream block that's happened in the Atlantic Ocean. So when you just look at the last uh, week, so the 8th through the 15th, that time period, there's been multiple times where the pattern has really become stacked up and blocked up here. And that seems to just push everything back. See how there's a ridge there that connects with this ridge, which connects here. And when we look back, I just said, well, what did the model say about this You know, back in January when I was forecasting? Notice they didn't have that. That block was nowhere to be found in the long range models. And that's not to blame the models. I just probably rely too heavily on them for guidance at times. You know, we try to pull in those teleconnections to make a story, but the reality of it is, is they're not perfectly connected. So when you predict the weather three, four weeks in advance and the models miss a substantial feature here, it's very hard to sniff that out and to see that they've missed it. So every time they keep forecasting the ridge to back up, it's not doing that because there's no downstream reason for it to, to do that. You know what I'm saying? Now, I have seen um, some indications of change. So for example, over the last couple of weeks, we've really picked up a lot of momentum in the jet stream, uh, you know, at the higher latitudes. The momentum has fallen off in the, the subtropical area. And that's a big change over where things had been before this. Do you see the differences here? So we're, I'm looking for anything that would say this pattern has a chance of breaking down. And I also go look at the MJO, you know, like we've been talking about. It's in the Indian Ocean right now. See what these colors, these dark blue greens are. And it's going to stay between there and Australia. And so much of this winter, it's been over here in, in phase seven, eight, and even at times into phase one. So we start to see those changes and we, we ask, is this enough or is there going to be a big lag on the change? In other words, okay, the MJO's moved, the momentum has shifted, but it's not going to produce an immediate effect. And so we wonder if this effect is going to come in at any point in March, because if the MJO is in fact here and is going to sweep through as it's forecast through phases four and five, that does represent, as we talked about on Monday, a sizable shift overall. And I keep showing you these graphics, but all of these want to point toward more ridging here, right? And, <clears throat> you know, th all the blues that you see across north, this is all great jet stream level flow to return moisture to a lot of people from west coast to the central plains that need it, to the southern plains. We would, we would want this to happen at this point. But does the blocking remain here? keeping this ridge closer to North America? That is ultimately the question because the models want to back it up. Let me show you what I mean. So this is uh, the forecast for the first week of March. You still see the ridge there. But watch as I play this forward, going through the second week of March into the third week. Wh what do they do? They pull this back toward the Aleutian Islands. See that? That drops the flow, comes zonal across the United States, runs out here into the, into the North Atlantic. And if this was going to verify this would finally return moisture, at least from Northern California through the Pacific Northwest. It would be better for a big section of the mid part of the country. In fact, let's just go look at it here. I'll pull up the 30 day outlook um, and this is the next 30 days, but let's get fully into March here. See, th this is returning more moisture into this area. It's drier to the South just simply because that's the, the way the jet stream has to respond, uh, or the, excuse me, the precipitation would have to respond if the flow comes through like this. But I, I, th I think that it's right in this area, keeping this region wet. I think it's biased, too dry here. I think we're gonna see better moisture even back into Texas and then through this area. Uh, the drier that you see in California, that's gonna be a, the case until, well, and I don't think this is gonna happen, but we would get strong southwestern subtropical jet stream flow. That just doesn't happen when there's a La Nina in the Pacific. That's a very uh, difficult thing to, to come by here. So I look at this new forecast and you kind of look at it week by week. And I'll just mention this. The week that I'm, I'm most interested in seeing is going to be this one. All right. 
this would be week three. So we're out there looking at like um, the, the, the 10th through the 17th of March. That's a time period where I think the jet stream may finally adjust. It's two weeks in a lag behind the MJO movement to phase three. And sometimes that happens, but that would bring in better moisture for a lot of places in the West and unfortunately still keep this area quite active. Um, that's currently what I'm seeing in the long range. And again, I'm relying on some model predictions, but I think we could get that MJO teleconnection to finally produce these kind of results. Um, in the North Pacific, in the North Atlantic, looking at the Arctic Oscillation, the Antarctic Oscillation, the Polar Vortex, I think they are playing kind of second fiddle to what's going on in the tropics. That's, that's my analysis uh, for this. So there we go. We've got an idea about the longer term. Let's come back now to what we've had just in the last 72 hours. This is good. The fact that moisture did come back this far to the west, this is great because we do have this area still, of course, in drought. Our problem areas extend where we've got too much water currently. And we look back over just this you know, last three days, and there have been places from Missouri and Southern Illinois, right here where the Ohio and Mississippi come together, that have measured in excess of three to four inches of rainfall. And now it's snowing on the back side of this. Our all hazards weather map shows the current system, still winter storm warnings in through this area. This is all flood watch, and all of this down here is high wind. We do have some areas in here where we have flood warnings and severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings actually in here at this particular moment. Then we have a little clipper coming through, and we've got a blizzard warning on that little clipper because of how strong the winds are going to be. Let's go take a look at it. I'm going to show you the high res 18Z um, NAM model. So let's get this up to about when I'm recording here, about 6 o'clock this evening. And so what you see is there's our elongated squall line. The system's still pulling through Indiana and Ohio, southern Michigan and Ontario, and then it finally moves into the northeast. But it's really moving fast. I mean, this is through 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, right? That's how quickly that system's out. Prepare for very strong winds on the backside of this and scattered storms as the system exits. There's our clipper. Now, why is it given a blizzard warning? Look how tightly spaced the isobars are. When that snow comes through, we're going to be seeing wind gusts here easily past the blizzard criteria of 35 miles an hour. So that little system goes through, sets up over the Great Lakes, brings in some snow to parts of southern Minnesota, Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan, and finally into lower Michigan by Friday evening. So that system rolls on into New England, brings in some scattered snow there as well. Behind it, a big area of high pressure. We'll talk about what that's going to do to the temperatures. But what you need to watch is where this goes, because when it goes back over here, at the end of the weekend and the next low you can almost see it here dives down this is going to feed it on the back side with moisture and this will start off our next system so let's go take a look at our multi-model analysis to see that so we've already looked at very briefly here this system exiting and we've got the clipper right here rolling through on friday into friday night so we've looked at that in the high res models so there's that high pressure cell, both in the GFS and the European. And watch where it goes by Sunday. See it sitting right there over the mid-Atlantic? What we've done again, okay, is the flow comes around like this. There's an elongated front sitting right here. Just the same setup we just talked about for this current system. A system pulls through the northeast, excuse me, the northwest, brings in some snow to the mountains like the Cascades, dives into, you know, the Great Basin, the Intermountain West, and then emerges. So once again, next you know Tuesday into Wednesday, we'll watch out for this area for strong to severe storms. We're going to see some ice out of this system, but look at where it's putting down the snow, much farther to the north in places that we desperately need to have this snow. Now we now to pay close attention to the track of this, but I'll show you the ensembles in a few moments. This is going out to Tuesday into Wednesday, and that system goes quickly into New England. And then both models attempt to bring in yet another system on the deeper trough that's in the west well, in the Four corner states, coming out next Wednesday and Thursday. And you can see it showing up in both models here. Now they're going to diverge in their solution because we're more than a week out in the forecast here uh, using the 12Z runs. But the point is to say that we've got multiple systems, the one we're currently dealing with, the one coming in on Tuesday, Wednesday, and then another one late next week that we have to be paying close attention to. Let's kind of stitch it all together and let's just look at the snowfall from this first you can see that this was from the current system rolling through and there's the clipper all right and then following that here's the system coming into the the northwest and that's a system that shows up if we go from monday into tuesday and wednesday right here through south dakota minnesota and wisconsin and we need this snow band to expand in size get farther to the south to deliver more moisture 
And as it rolls through here, um, it's you know going to be producing a band of three to eight inches of snow in an area that des like this part of South Dakota desperately needs it. We get quite a bit of snow, I mean, not as much as we could see, but quite a bit of snow in the west out of this one as well. Now, I'll stop this out here at um, 168 hours. That's a week because I want to compare it to the GFS. So that's the GFS solution, European GFS. That's pretty good model agreement on this snow. So um, thinking about that, the moisture side of it, that's why I showed you this. There's a region in through here that's going to get the rain out of this and the storms again and the next two systems after this one. So that air is going to stay wet. But if we just take a look again at the probability of getting three inches of snow, we're putting out some snow in places that really do need it right in through this area. And that's, that's a good signal. Now from here, I want to show you the icing potential on this from the European model. Because we've seen this is the ice from the current system. The next one that comes through, okay, remember this is Monday into Tuesday. They've moved this band of heavy ice around quite a bit, and I don't yet know where it's going to be. This is going to shift a lot. But once again, with the overrunning, I'll be concerned about ice. And with that third system, the models are aggressively putting down some ice in the southern plains as well. Now, we again, we don't know the details with this. Usually, forecasting an ice storm is best done within two days of it happening. I just want to let you know that the setup on these systems is conducive to producing that ice. Now, what happens after this? All right. By next Thursday, there's the trough responsible for these systems. And then as we go into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, this is the end of the month, we still have our, our major problem here. There's an upstream block. There's the big ridge that sits along the west coast, which means that February will finish dry for the west. Does this move and when does it move? I think it doesn't really fully break down until after we're, we're through the first full week of March. And that's unfortunate because we want it to break down sooner to return better moisture there. So when you look, the West still carries a drier bias going through the first three days of March. But, and, and we, we kind of lose the, the, the signal. So if you notice, this particular jet stream flow, whoops, sorry, like that, produces a lot of convergence in through here. So you end up getting a drier signal to start the month of March. So maybe it'll be a situation where February goes out like a lion and March comes in like a lamb when it comes to the systems we're going to watch come through at that point. On the temperature, oops, I just want to show you, uh, the GFS model is in agreement with this. That's the forecast for week two from the GFS, all right? Uh, on, the, um, on the temperature side of it, we've got quite a big changeover in temperatures behind the first system. So watch, we're going to have, these were the temperatures we saw on Thursday, Friday that cold air presses east. But already we get a warm up happening again in parts of the plains over the weekend. This is the cold air coming behind the quick hitting clipper, all right? And as we go from Saturday into Sunday and Monday, this is the warm up ahead of the next big system. Now, this next system coming through on Monday, Tuesday delivers high temperatures that will be measured in the negative single digits in parts of North Dakota. And that cold air really sinks in behind it on Tuesday into Wednesday of next week. In fact, when we look out there, just looking at day 5 through 10, uh, the temperatures right now are reading colder than 20 degrees below average with this shot of cold air. Now, this is the tropospheric polar vortex, not the stratospheric polar vortex that's coming through, which means it's going to move and move through relatively quickly, such that when we start the month of March, we'll already start to push that colder air east and, and, and relieve kind of the North America from the depth of it. So it's not sticking around, but for more than, you know, four or five days overall. But that's just a look now at the next two weeks in terms of precip and temperatures, and the pattern's going to be quite active as we finish this month and start the next. Big questions that will loom is, can we get the pattern to break down to allow better flow into the west? That is key to reviving moisture to the west, to the midwest, and places that need it. So I'll be watching all that this weekend. I'll report back to you again on Monday. I appreciate your attention. Thanks.